please welcome Dr. Melina Jampolis. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. How many of you did I have the pleasure of meeting in Dallas? How many were of you in Dallas last August? Okay. Hi again, everybody. Good to see you. Welcome back. Um, hi. I wrote you kept your hand up, right? I'm really, really excited to be here. And, and I love the messaging that I'm already hearing, the idea of inspiration, because that is truly what I try to do every day, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with my patients or on CNN or on Dr. Stork's show, which I'm going to be shooting something with him on Friday on The Doctors talking about this. I'm really, really, he's a great guy, isn't he? You guys enjoyed hearing him last night. But I, I'm truly passionate, and, and I have my entire medical career, I just want to give you a little bit of background on me so you really understand how committed I am to this concept. I, I'm a board-certified internist, and I started out in internal medicine, and I practiced for six months in the county hospital in San Jose, California. And all I did all day, every day, was I got to spend about three minutes with patients, and I put them on drugs. I put them on drugs for diabetes. I put them on drugs for high cholesterol. I put them on drugs for you name it, high blood pressure, and I was looking at them. I didn't have a single second to even talk to them about what I feel is the most important medicine and, and the prevention component. I wrote them scripts, and I felt like I was making the pharmaceutical companies millions of dollars. That's okay, I'll just kick it into the audience. But I really wasn't having a profound impact on people's health. So I actually left medicine after studying, being in school for God knows how long, 18 years, I left medicine just for a short period of time because I was so discouraged. And I ended up getting a part-time job at a weight loss clinic. And it was kind of one of those light bulb moments in life because for the first time, I saw how through this avenue, I could truly help people achieve wellness and focus on disease prevention. And so that actually, I've been doing this now for 12 years. And this, my entire career as a medical doctor then got board certified as a physician nutrition specialist. Because for me, food as medicine is the most obvious use of my expertise as a medical doctor and what I can do to help people the most. And what I think you can do as leaders in this field and as role models to really inspire people to focus on prevention rather than treatment or curing through the traditional medicine. So the best doctor, in my opinion, gives the least medicines. And I, I you know the interesting thing, more and more, <laughs> thank, I, that's powerful, right? I just, I found this quote and it really resonated with me because now as a physician nutrition specialist, I spend my time in my office, half of the time is dealt with dealing with, you know, medical conditions. The other half is dealing with the side effects of medications, with nutrient deficiencies, with side effects of medications that are intolerable that we have to, that the physician doesn't take the time to address. So I really think this statement is incredibly powerful. And the other thing that I know is that, you know, we certainly, there's a tremendous body of research looking at genetics, genetics and disease, genetics and weight management. You just have to look around the room to see that people come in all different shapes and sizes. And so certainly there is no question that genetics loads the gun. We are all born with a certain genetic predisposition to having heart disease, to having cancer, to having autoimmune conditions, to not being able to lose weight easily. But at the end of the day, I am 100% convinced that in almost 80% of cases, it's lifestyle pulling the trigger. So if you can empower, you can be role models and yourself adopt this preventive lifestyle and encourage people, it doesn't matter if the gun is loaded because if, if you don't pull the trigger, the diseases don't manifest themselves and you can truly lead your best life. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the tragic statistics of obesity. I'm going to talk a little bit about the causes too because I think that gives us insight into the treatments and how things like your 
transformation, your program, the holistic weight management program could play an important role because of some of the causes that are frankly just beyond our control in the environment. I'm gonna talk about inflammation and disease. I know that's an important topic that your company is very focused on addressing. And I'm gonna talk about why that is so clinically relevant and how it pertains to obesity. And then I'm going to go into an anti-inflammatory diet because to me, that is the essence of health. Yeah, it would be great if we could all fit into our genes from high school, but at the end of the day, the reality is, is that if we can control inflammation, that is truly the lifestyle mediated trigger that can set you off in terms of a disease actually manifesting itself, even if you have a genetic predisposition. So first we're gonna talk about the statistics. And interestingly enough, since I gave this talk, a similar talk in August to you all, this slide has changed because they just added the 2010 slide. When I gave the talk in August, we only had data up through 2007. In 2007, there was still one state in the country that had blue, which is only a 15 to 19% incidence of obesity, which is defined as a body mass index of greater than 30, being 30 to 50 pounds overweight. Now, there's none. There's no blues left. The minimum obesity rate, not just overweight, five or 10 pounds, obesity, is 20%, that's the lowest of any of the states. And in 2007, there were only three of the dark orange states that are greater than 30% obesity. So one in every three people is obese. Now we have 10 to 12 where a third of the population is obese. Not just overweight, this is clinically obese. So we're clearly not going in the right direction with this. And we're definitely not going in the right direction when it comes to kids. And I think, you know, our current administration talks about this a lot, but, you know, I really think that this is such a serious problem. You can't talk about it enough because at this point, one in three of our children will be diabetic as adults. And I think something that we don't think about that much, but that I deal with a lot because I volunteer in Los Angeles with low-income minority communities, families helping them struggle with obese children, is the psychological impact of obesity on these, in these kids. Not only are they developing high cholesterol at the age of eight, but psychologically, they're picked on, they're bullied. It, it really leads to a lifetime of challenges. And the, actually, the even more terrifying thing is that there's a lot of information now that in utero exposure, so if you're pregnant and you're not adopting healthy eating habits and you're overweight to start with, that that can actually program your baby to have weight problems and metabolic problems their entire life. So even before, you know, the teen increase in obesity, we're also seeing in utero programming in two-year-olds that are overweight. Medical complications of obesity, I went over this before, seven different cancers definitively linked from head to toe. Every system in your body is affected by obesity. This is absolutely, and it is not just a vanity thing. This is truly affecting everything. And I, the good news is, is that in my office, I see reversal of many of these diseases. I get people off medications for diabetes, off medications for high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I see reversal of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is now the leading cause of cirrhosis. It's not alcoholism anymore in this country. It's obesity that's causing us to get inflammation of our livers that can lead to cirrhosis and even death in some cases. So this is a very, very significant crisis but what is it about obesity? I mean, yeah, sure, it's hard on your joints and your heart has to work a little harder. But the true nature of the danger associated with obesity is the concomitant inflammation. We used to think that fat was just a storage depot for extra calories, that it was just a nuisance, that it, but that it was not an active organ in your body. And what we've learned in the last 10 years, really, and really in the last five, is that fat is a very, very active organ. It is constantly secreting chemicals, inflammatory mediators, signals to our brain, to our gut, to store fat, not to store fat, to eat. It's in constant communication with our body. And it's a very 
pro-inflammatory organ, particularly when it's carried around the middle. You hear a lot about belly fat. It's a very misunderstood concept. It's not the spare tire that you have that's kind of a nuisance that maybe hangs over those jeans that are a little too tight. It's this deep belly fat within your stomach that actually is even more inflammatory than female fat. We tend, women tend to carry our weight up until menopause in our butt and our legs. And then as we go through menopause and estrogen levels drop, it shifts to your gut. Men, unfortunately, their entire lives tend to carry it more in the beer belly area. And this is the really pro-inflammatory dangerous. You can see, you're not going to be tested on this later, but you can see all the inflammatory signals that are involved. This is a very complex process, and it leads into diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all sorts of markers of inflammation, higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and inflammation, many people believe, is one of the triggers for cancer. So again, you can have that genetic predisposition for cancer, but unless you have that long-term inflammation in your body, you may never develop it. So it's a very important issue to address, the idea that Fat is actually a toxic organ of its own. So what about the causes of obesity? Again, I think this is important because it can help you in supporting because you can have all the best products in the world. And I'm sure you guys have some of the leading products. But if you don't support people, anybody who's ever tried to lose weight in this audience knows that it truly requires a holistic approach and a holistic understanding of the challenges that we face. So what are some of the challenges? Sugar has really been villainized in recent years, and rightly so. I think we are, we are having some t somewhere as much as five times as much sugar as we should be having. And the majority of that is in sugar-sweetened beverages. These statistics are really shocking. So not only are we having too much sugar, but when you have it in the form of beverages, these hundreds and hundreds of calories of sugar and beverages, the brain does not register fullness and hunger like it does from solid food. So having liquid sugar calories is really a twofold insult. You have the extra sugar, which causes, you know, its own set of metabolic problems, but then you have the extra calories, which lead to weight gain because you drink all this and your body doesn't think it's full. Portion size, I think I talked about this in Dallas, but the average dinner plate has increased significantly, the average size of a burger. And there was a really interesting study. This may seem not that relevant. It's like, okay, well, do we really fill up our plates? Are we really that governed by what we see? The answer is yes. Did I talk about the bottomless soup bowl in Dallas? Does anybody remember? Okay, good. They did a study called the bottomless soup bowl. And they put people in a lab and they had two bowls, they had two, on two different occasions. And on one of them, they had a little straw in the bottom of the soup bowl so that it slowly and imperceptibly refilled as the person was drinking it. So on day one they had, and they, they wanted to see how much the people ate compared to just the regular soup bowl. On the day where they ate out of the bottomless soup bowl, the people ate 73% more soup, they didn't report feeling any fuller, and they didn't eat any more at the next meal. So the idea that we eat with our eyes and not with our stomachs and that these giant portions or increased portions are really increasing consumption is absolutely clinically validated. So that's where I like products that build in portion control. I think that's a fundamental part of the whole equation. Technology and mechanization. It's, it's amazing. I wanted to do, actually I wanted to do this for the doctors because I went in once and had a meeting with the executive producer and he actually had a remote control to open and close his office door for me. I mean, I, I was like, this goes beyond, you know, laziness. And, but when you think about the impact of just basic things, there was a study that came out that showed just things like moving walkways and cars and dishwashers and washing machines, just through those basic things, 
we burn 122 fewer calories a day just from, and that's not including computers or cell phones or mobile phones, all these things to where we don't have to move anymore. So we have to offset that somehow, but certainly technology has played a very significant role. It's given us a lot of information, but it's also led to a lot of sedentary behavior. And increased food exposure. It's really interesting to me because when I go into these low-income minority neighborhoods, there's often a fast food outlet on every single corner. And this constant exposure, there's new research that shows that our brain actually lights up when we see food triggers. Like if we see commercials, if we see the McDonald's golden arches, our brain actually, excitatory pathways in our brain are actually triggered to cause you to want to eat and to crave those foods that are associated with whatever the stimulus is. So in this 20, I, I called it, I said this on CNN with Dr. Gupta, we live in an obesogenic environment. We're moving less, we're constantly exposed to food, we're eating way more sugar, quickly digested carbs that are actually making us crave more sugar. And it's, I don't know how anybody wins the battle. It really takes a holistic approach to tackle this problem. So what about, what is a healthy diet? I get asked that all the time. It's, it's an easy question because there's, should I cut gluten? Should I go low carb? Should I go high carb, fat free? Should I cut sugar? Is it okay to have a little sugar? Well, what's not, you know, here's your choice, you know, in the healthy diet. I certainly, I, I, I emphasize it because I don't want you all to be having to resort to these pill bottles on the left. I think a healthy diet can substitute for those. What's happening here? So what, what is not a healthy diet is the standard American diet, which is abbreviated SAD, which is very appropriate. You can see almost half the diet is added fats and oils and flour and cereal products and then caloric sweeteners. You see how small the fruits and vegetable triangle is, dairy and meat and eggs. And, and the problem with that is, yes, the, we're not eating enough fruits and vegetables in the first place, and the nutrient density of our produce because of modern agricultural practices has actually decreased. So even if you are one of the few people that's getting those five to seven servings a day of fruits and vegetables, the nutrients in your broccoli have significantly declined because of changes in soil quality in the types of fertilizers we use instead of rotating crops and seasonal farming. And in addition, the nutrient density of produce has changed. So we're not if you notice, it's funny because I went to the farmer's market in Beverly Hills and there's this place called Harry's Berries. And that's where I got these tiny little strawberries that you see on the left side. But you never, do you ever see anything like that in the supermarket? We've exploded, our fruits are like three times what they used to be a couple generations ago. And so you end up getting a nutrient dilution effect. So again, even if you are having, if you're one of the few people that's having an appropriate number of fruits and vegetables every day, you may not be getting the nutrient-dense diet that you need, which is I, why I believe that supplements really do play a role in filling in those gaps. So I'd like to talk a little bit about something called the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. And basically, you know, the government certainly has its recommendations for how we should eat and what a healthy diet is. Unfortunately, when you look at people who follow those recommendations the most closely, they aren't necessarily that healthy. They have fairly high levels of inflammation in their body. So a group of researchers from around the world set out to actually look at populations who have the greatest longevity. So populations like the Mediterraneans or Okinawa or different populations that seem to really live better and longer. And they came up with something called the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. And what they found was that when they applied this to people, they found a 25% decrease in all-cause mortality or death, a 40% decrease in death due to heart disease, and that the index, how closely you adhered to it, was actually able to predict your risk of heart disease ahead of time, 30% lower markers of inflammation, and they found that it was beneficial even if you didn't lose weight. So we know weight loss is hard. We know we live in an obesogenic environment. We're constantly stimulated to eat and not to move. So even by incorporating these healthy habits 
on a regular basis, you can significantly decrease your risk of diseases like diabetes and cancer and heart disease. So what is involved? Five servings of vegetables a day, four cups of fruit, four servings of fruit. And the key is variety when it comes to this. And this is hard. I was thinking about that. You know, the average person only eats about 20 foods, 20 different foods a week. You know, we don't have a tremendous amount of variety in our diet, but that's really one of the critical parts. And why are fruits and vegetables, we all kind of know that they're important, but why? We're constantly bombarded with environmental insults, toxins from the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the products we put on our skin. So we're constantly generating free radicals. And fruits and vegetables are one of the key sources of antioxidants in the diet. Unfortunately, the average American doesn't take full advantage of this. We do great when it comes to coffee, tea, and potatoes, but you can see we're really sh falling short on antioxidants. And they are such powerful disease modulators, things like carotenoids, which are the red, orange category, even deep green in some cases. Talk about food as medicine. A 35% decreased risk in age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness in older adults, 20% increase in lung function, 60% decreased risk of prostate cancer. Also, a recent study just came out showing that women with the highest levels of carotenoids in their blood had a decreased risk of breast cancer, a 39% decreased risk of death, and lycopene in, in particular, we all know it for protecting the prostate and being a great source, but it's also important for bone loss. And a study just came out showing that it was critically important in older men for preventing bone loss. So this is really a lifelong nutrient and, and fruits and vegetables are key. And polyphenols is one of the categories. This is a whole nother lecture in and of itself. I get, I get pretty excited about polyphenols actually, but this class, and, and it comes from a variety of deeply colored fruits and vegetables where they have found that these components in these foods and beverages actually turn on and off genes and proteins in your body that regulate metabolism, that regulate blood sugar, that regulate inflammation, that regulate cholesterol. So by having a variety, and the thing about getting them from a food source is they come with lots of different complementary components to where you really get a systemic effect and you can benefit from the multiple different plant-based nutrients that are in these fruits and vegetables. The other thing that I think we forget about when it comes to produce, and this is, I think, one of the single, one of the two most important things for permanent weight loss. The first is incorporating more lean protein into your diet. The second is this idea of energy density. How many people have heard of this concept of calorie density, energy density? Anybody? Okay, a few people. So, so what it means is it's the calories per serving, right? So both of these meals have equ exactly equivalent calories. Exactly. Which do you think is going to really fill? Okay, I know a few people in this room, um, Regis and Kelly Boomer would probably say he'd want the bacon cheeseburger, he doesn't care. But most of us would feel a lot more physically satisfied by the meal on the right. And this is what produce brings to the equa equa equation, is by incorporating more fruits and vegetables in your diet, whether it's into soups or casseroles or sandwiches or different types of salads or even dips. You can cut calories without cutting portions. And this is where I think fruits and vegetables really play an essential role in weight management are, are an integral part of the equation. The second part of the alternative healthy eating index is having at least one serving of nuts or soy a day. And I think the soy is certainly a little bit more controversial because of the GMO issue, because we process it so much. But at the end of the day, soy does have those polyphenols when it's minimally processed. It does have polyphenols, which can be protective against numerous conditions. And research shows that replacing just some of the animal protein in your diet Diet, with plant protein like nuts and soy can significantly lower your risk of heart disease. And nuts in general are a great source of plant-based protein, monounsaturated fat, poly, fiber, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. They can help lower cholesterol. And everybody says, what, then the, what nut is best? 
a variety. If you leave with anything at the end of the day, a variety of healthy foods is a very important weapon against general disease prevention. 15, wheat has gotten a bad rap in the last couple of years with the paleo diet and the wheat belly diet and the gluten-free diet. I get asked about this all the time. The reality is, is wheat, first of all, is one of the top source of antioxidants in our diet. People forget about that. When it's un- processed or whole grains. And a lot of the research showing the benefit of fiber in the diet are really from the whole grain component where you have the entire seed. And as part of the Alternative Health Eating Index, 15 grams of cereal-based fiber, so grain-based fiber, is really the protective component. And again, food is medicine. Only 5% of us are getting three servings of whole grains a day. And if you look at it, it decreases the risk of heart disease, surprisingly infectious disease and respiratory disease, and death from any cause. In major studies that National Institute of Health, AARP, three servings a day, everybody thinks they need to cut wheat to lose weight. The actual research shows that if you can get three servings a day of whole grains, in place of refined grains, you can decrease your risk of that dangerous belly fat by 10%. And you have a greater than 50% decreased risk of dying from coronary heart disease for those who consumed the most fiber, insoluble and soluble. And that's, you know, why you need the whole grain because they naturally come with a good combination of both. What else is in the Alternative Health Eating Index? Trans fats, we know those are the bad guys of the nutrition world. Thanks to new labeling, since 2006, a company has to list how many trans fats are in their product. But unfortunately, there's a loophole. A company, a product can have up to 0.5 grams per serving and say trans fat free on the front of the packaging. So you really have to be an informed consumer and look at labels and look for the word partially hydrogenated. Partially hydrogenated anything, if you can possibly avoid these products, you really should. And the main place that they still exist is in baked goods, in commercial frosting, and things like that at the grocery store. So you do still have to be a savvy, savvy consumer and minimize them as much as possible. They're pro-inflammatory, they raise bad cholesterol, and decrease good cholesterol. So they have a really negative effect, particularly on heart disease, but they've also been linked to general inflammation. As far as saturated fat, you know, it's gotten a bad rap, but in recent years, some of the research has been kind of a little bit more on the fence about how bad it really is for us. And this Alternative Healthy Eating Index found that as long as you eat more of the healthy fats than the unhealthy fats, you significantly decrease your risk of disease. So it really is about ratio. So it does with anything in nutrition. People want to be told what to do. They want an all or nothing approach. They want me to tell them that a food is good or it's bad. But the reality is it may not be the most exciting thing, but in moderation, you can have a little butter on your whole grain toast. You can have a little bit of mayo in your omega-3 rich tuna salad sandwich on whole grain bread with romaine lettuce. So it's really how you put the whole equation together. And speaking of omega-3 fatty acids, these are really the rock stars of the nutrition world, in my opinion. They are a type of polyunsaturated fatty acid, which have very important disease-modifying effects. And I know there's been a lot in the research. I know I've been on CNN several times in the last few months because every week it seems like there's a new study telling you one way or the other that they're good for us or they're bad for us. But I can tell you that on a basic level, I, I think from food for sure, but also from supplementation in the appropriate cases, they are an essential part of primary prevention for optimal health. And a study just came out Monday that I'm actually going on Friday to talk about on CNN that was one of the best done studies because it's very hard to do studies in nutrition. I think that's where some of the data is a little bit more iffy is it, it's very hard to control food as a variable. You know, you can give somebody a pill, but if you say, hey, what did you eat yesterday? How many of you can remember exactly what you ate yesterday? How many of you could write that down? 
Very, I, I don't think I, you could. <laughs> All right, what'd you have? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but very few of, I, I don't think I could. And that's what a lot of these research studies go by, is they go by what's called food frequency questionnaires which rely on your memory, which isn't that precise of a measurement. The study that came out Monday that I'll actually be talking about on Sanjay's show on Friday, uh, that's going to be on over the weekend, they actually measured the blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids. And they found that by looking at an actual objective marker of omega-3 fatty acid intake, that they found a significant reduction in the risk of death particularly due to heart disease uh, and, and arrhythmias in particular. So I think it's, it's one of the most definitive studies in the primary prevention. And they looked at these people for 10 years, from the age of 64 to 75. So this is primary prevention in a higher risk population. And so I think this is, this is you know, really reinforces the body of research supporting omega-3 fatty acids. But they really do act as powerful anti-inflammatory agents. They're essential for heart health. And I think they also play a very important role in different inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis. There's some good research on depression. Alzheimer's is a little bit more challenging. And ADHD. There's a lot of DHA, one of the type of omega-3 fatty acids, in the brain. And so it makes sense that having appropriate levels of this would be relevant when it comes to optimal brain function. And interestingly, a study just came out last year that also showed a supportive role for bone health and for age-related muscle loss. So I talk a lot about omega-3s in a lecture that I give on the secrets of aging gracefully. What else is in the Alternative Healthy Eating Index? Greater than five years of a multivitamin use. This is another area that's really, I have to, I've been working for CNN for almost five years now as their diet and fitness expert. So I constantly have to deal with the headlines. And it seems like every month there's a different headline reaching a different conclusion on multivitamins or different supplements. But what I can, and, and again, it's very hard to control. Because if I say this, this group, you can't have any multivitamins, you can't have any fortified foods, you can't take anything, and I want to follow you for 10 years. What do you think the chances are that this group of hundreds of thousands of people is not going to take any fortified food? So there's a lot of what we call confounding variables with these multivitamin studies. And so it's very difficult to isolate the benefit versus risk. I think when it comes to you know, big conditions, these aren't disease modifiers. But I really do, because of what I talked about with the drop in soil quality and the nutrient density of our diet, and the fact that it's just plain hard to get everything that we need on a daily basis, I do think that a multivitamin plays a critical role in the entire equation. And this Alternative Healthy Eating Index supports that. Moderate alcohol, thank God this for this fun event. No, I, I, I just moved from San Francisco, so I was a big, all my patients were Napa winemakers. So I made sure that they knew that I was willing to do barter any time for my services. So I, uh, anybody who, if you're ever in LA, I've got a good wine selection. But um, this really, and again, the, the interesting thing is, is that this really applies to different types of alcohol. But I think one of the things about this that I think is important for you all to take out is that, there is no one size fits all. So while I, I do believe in the benefits of moderate alcohol, and studies show that they are not associated with increased weight, many people assume that alcohol causes weight gain, um, but it, it actually is not in moderate intakes. It's actually associated, associated with a decreased risk of diabetes. But if somebody came to me and they had a very strong family history of breast cancer, for example, or, or, or had had breast cancer, this would not be one of the suggestions that I would make to them. Uh, to, I, to, right, because there is an association between alcohol intake and an increased risk of breast cancer, hormone positive, because of the impact that, this new, that uh, alcohol has on the metabolism of estrogen. So this is another take-home point is that there is no one size fits all. Even though these guidelines are very good for most of the people, I think it's important to work on an individual basis and, and, and you know, when you're giving health recommendations and even giving products. So, um, and really, again, the benefits in particular with alcohol seem to apply to wine. 
because of resveratrol. This is one of the, this is another type of polyphenol that actually works on a cellular and molecular level, helping to have, fight cancer, helping to protect against heart disease, and in some cases, also helping to boost immune function. So this is, when we talk about food as medicine, I, I'm really, I'm being serious that this is really, in many cases, acting like a mild drug without all the side effects. And you can think about when you combine these multiple different approaches that you really could have a profound impact on long-term health. And again, the health benefits of drinking wine, a 6% decreased risk of prostate cancer per glass of wine consumed weekly, a decreased risk of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes, and it also showed lower levels of inflammation of a marker called C-reactive protein in the blood. We now have a way of measuring inflammation in the blood called C-reactive protein that's practical and very user-friendly. I do it with all of my patients. And something as simple as having an occasional glass of wine can help lower levels of inflammation in the body. And the last thing, and this is not part of the alternative healthy eating index, but it is such a critical component of the equation, and I think it's such an exciting area. And again, I actually just did a segment on the doctors um, a couple weeks ago looking at and, and discussed in great detail the role of spices. We, we think a lot about food as medicine, but spices are a plant-based product. And there is more and more emerging research showing that spices are a tremendous source of nutraceutical type of products that really have a profound functional benefit in the body. Things like cinnamon we know about, all different spices, cayenne pepper. And I think really the most exciting for me, and I think it's very interesting that one of your products really features this because the most interesting to me is without question curcumin, which is in turmeric, which you see in this picture. And I really, I'm not just talking about, I talked about it in Dallas too, before you even had the product. What I actually, um, the, uh, it's interesting because the National Institute of Health is really starting to become more and more involved in this idea of food as medicine. And about a year ago, they did a webinar exclusively on curcumin and the idea of the potential of this spice. It regulates over 30 different pathways in the body related to various components. Research shows that not only is it a potent anti-inflammatory, it actually also seems to cut off blood supply to new blood vessels, which is a bad thing that feed the tumor cells, and also to fat cells in animal studies. And actually a study just came out last week where researchers gave women uh, they, they compared the impact of an eight-week exercise program versus a daily regimen of curcumin supplementation. And they found that they were both equivalent in terms of something called flow media dilation, media dilation, which is the ability of your blood vessels to relax which is a very critical component because when your blood vessels are stiff and they can't relax, that compromises blood flow. That can, is what leads to ischemic heart disease where your, your heart doesn't get enough oxygen, where stroke, where your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, transient ischemic attacks, which is like an early stroke. So they showed in this group that curcumin was equivalent to an eight week aerobic exercise program. Now, in terms of that benefit of exercise. Now, again, I don't want anybody to think that now you can take this instead of going to the gym for 30 minutes a day or going for your power walk or doing the Zumba class like you did before. But I think this really reinforces the power of food as medicine and, and spices being a critical part of that and polyphenols and antioxidant-rich foods. And again underscores that it can play a role in overall health 
regardless of your weight status. Obviously, weight is still an essential component of the entire equation. And it's something that I, in my office, it's my main area of practice is weight management. Um, but I'm always thinking in terms of optimal health in addition to that. And you can see by adopting these components of the Alternative Healthy Eating Index, no matter what the scale shows, I can assure you that you will have lower levels of inflammation, lower le levels of disease, and live a healthier, more vital life. So again, to reiterate, I, 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 this, is, this is what I do all day, every day. This is what I study. This is what I practice. This is what I preach, is the truly the power of letting food be thy medicine. And I think there are some very important components your new, to your new weight loss program that can fit perfectly into what I try to instill in the population to fight this major problem, which is the combination of obesity and inflammation. So I hope that you've learned some tools that you can take out back to the field to really empower not only yourself to live a better life, but also, you know, the people that you're contacting on a daily basis, the graph of people that are being impacted um, by this. And, um, this is just, I, I've written a couple of books on that. You know, I, I try to be as user-friendly as possible. My, uh, my book, um, The No Time to Lose Diet, is really geared towards busy people, which I think most of you are. And, and you know, I, I, I'm not one of those people that think, not one of those experts that think you should only eat whole food. So supplemental products, and my husband is actually completely addicted to your, uh, the, the, protein powder that you guys have. He's like, you have to bring some back from your meeting because things like that. So products that can really support all these healthy eating components that I talked about, I think are a really critical part of the equation. And then the book, my book, The Calendar Diet, was really the idea, and I think this is something that you can bring out to people as well, is the idea of seasonal eating. Because when you eat produce in season, Number one, it's less expensive. Number two, it tastes better. And number three, it's more nutrient dense. So encouraging people to adopt a more seasonal eating can really amplify the nutrition potential of everything that I've discussed in this. So that's it for me. I'm actually, I went, I went a little bit ahead of schedule, which is unusual for me, but I don't even know if we have time for questions, but I, um, I'm grateful to be asked back. I'm really inspired by what you guys all do here. And, and again, it fits right into what I do, which is really trying to help people lead their best lives, not through getting on all the right drugs, in many cases through getting off the drugs and really just adopting a healthier lifestyle. So thank you again. I've, I don't know if we have time for questions or not.